care and feeding of werewolves. Episode 3, Care and Feeding of Vampires. And welcome to Care and Feeding of Werewolves, a podcast addressing issues and current events in the paranormal community. I'm your host, Hazel Thornton. Several listeners have asked about what happened to the wild miniature dragon who was brought in after being hit by a car. He's healing up really well and has built a nest on one of the shelves in the workroom. Since he doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon, we might just be stuck with him. I hope Nana doesn't mind having a pet dragon when she gets back. At least we've trained him to sterilize tools with his fire breathing. So we've named him Otto, which is short for autoclave. I mean, might as well put his destructive tendencies to good use. Today, we're going to talk about vampires, specifically their bites. Yes, they can be sexy if they're done right. You know what isn't sexy? Infection, nerve damage, loss of mobility, and major blood loss. There are dozens of different species categorized as vampires. Today, we're going to focus on the casual feeders, those who drink blood without killing their prey, and people who are willing donors. Most of today's episode will be aimed at the latter, but any vampires in the audience would do well to pay attention. Before you get started, make absolutely certain that you know what type of vampire you're tangling with. It would really suck to think you're hooking up with a damp here, when in actuality they're a draugr. Talk about catfishing. It's not only for your safety, but for theirs as well, because you should be aware of any allergies. For example, should you avoid garlic, silver, or symbols of faith? Accidentally poisoning your partner your first time together would leave a bad taste in everyone's mouth. It should go without saying, but both sides should first give consent. And we're not talking a quick, hey, are you cool with this? This should be a conversation where both parties set ground rules and expectations. For example, some vampires rely on seduction to find prey, but sex doesn't have to be a part of the act itself. That should be discussed before any collars get unbuttoned. The bite E should inform the bite of any medical conditions they may have, especially if it's anything like a blood disorder or compromised immune system. If you have hemophilia, and I cannot stress this enough, you should not be a donor. The flip side is that there are very few diseases vampires can transmit to their prey. That being said, it's not a bad idea to ask the biter to brush their teeth, floss, and maybe use some mouthwash beforehand to cut down on potential bacteria. For the deed itself, you should find a relatively clean, quiet place. As titillating (laughs) as it might seem. I'll wait for you to stop laughing over titillating. You done? Are you done? Thank you. Dark alleys are not suitable. If one of you gets startled, 
it's all too easy to tear an otherwise neat puncture site, inviting all kinds of bacteria to move in and set up shop. The next thing you know, you're getting your horribly infected neck cleaned out, which is a painful process and a course of antibiotics that'll scour your gut, all because a stray cat ran by at the wrong time. While vampires only need to bite to get the blood flowing, their fight or flight responses also involve teeth. So, even if you think you're safe because their fangs aren't currently in your flesh, they can still come back into play at a moment's notice. Next, agree on a suitable site for the bite itself. For the love of all that is good and right in the world, do not choose the wrist. Fangs are essentially nature's needles. You know the places where medical professionals stick needles? The wrist is not one of them for a very, very good reason. Do you know how many nerves and tendons there are in the wrist? Not to mention that the artery is relatively close to the surface. There's the neck, of course, a classic, and viable as long as you avoid the arteries and trachea, obviously. But if you're not involved romantically or sexually and prefer a more neutral site, there's always the dorsal veins. Those are the ones on the back of the hand or the cephalic vein, either on the inside of the elbow or where it runs along the side of the arm just before the wrist. Pretty much anywhere there's a juicy vein without a lot of pesky bones or nerves or tendons. Plus, you can slap a band-aid on it and tell people you just donated blood, which is technically true. My personal favorite is the inside of the thigh, which is often overlooked. As long as you steer clear of the bend of the thigh and are careful around the knee, you don't have to worry as much about damaging anything. The downside is that it's very important to keep the site clean and dry due to an increased risk of infection. The upside is that it's easily hidden by clothing, meaning fewer awkward questions about hickeys. Now that you're in a quiet, clean space and picked the vein, you can get down to business. Vampire saliva contains a soporific compound that can act as an aphrodisiac, which makes it easier for a vampire to feed. Anyone who's been roofied should be aware that this could be triggering. Since vampirism has gained in popularity amongst humans, there's been less need to feed from the unwilling, but evolution hasn't caught up yet. The saliva can affect your judgment, and you might not realize you've given too much until it's too late. To make sure the session doesn't go on for too long, try setting a timer. But not a sudden loud one. Remember that neither of you wants to get startled. Or consider having a trusted friend supervise the feeding. You may think that's being overly paranoid, but it's easy to lose track of things while having fun, especially if sex or drugs are in the mix. Humans and their derivatives, including witches and werewolves, can lose up to 15% of their blood, about three quarters of a liter, before experiencing any ill effects. Signs to watch out for include dizziness, headache, fatigue, thirst, weak pulse, drowsiness, rapid heart rate, shallow breathing. Although those last two could just be natural reactions to being bitten, depending on your proclivities. These symptoms can be difficult to recognize if the donor has used any drugs. So until you have a good idea of your limits, 
avoid bringing any other variables into the equation. If the donor shows any of these signs, the session should stop immediately or else they could go into shock. Feeding them some of the vampire's blood can help prevent that, but the donor might not want to imbibe. Besides, depending on the type of the vampire, that can lead to a whole host of other issues. What to do in case of too much blood loss should be discussed while going over consent. Caring for tears at the site is dependent on the placement of the bite and the extent of the damage. Steri strips are good for minimizing scarring and keeping the wound stable. However, if it's deep, over half an inch long, and or bleeds despite applying continuous pressure for five minutes, you may require stitches. If an artery does get nicked and the enzymes in vampire saliva don't seal it right away, seek medical attention immediately. Do not attempt to apply a tourniquet if you're not properly trained on how to do so safely. Once the fun's over, the saliva helps speed along healing, but it's not instant. You should keep an eye on the wound for the first couple of hours and keep it clean and dry. Although bandages aren't usually needed, they can help hide the puncture marks, and you can explain it away as a mosquito bite or something. If you notice inflammation, swelling, fever, or any other signs of infection, get it checked out. Swabbing the site beforehand with alcohol can help prevent infection, but rubbing alcohol isn't palatable to most vampires. Vodka can be used as long as it's 70 proof or higher. If it's less than that, then it's merely flavoring. Just like after clinical donation, the Bite E should drink plenty of fluids and have some cookies. Don't drive or do anything potentially hazardous if you feel lightheaded or dizzy. If you're going to be donating on a regular basis, make sure to eat plenty of foods rich in iron or discuss iron supplements with your doctor. If they're human, you don't have to specify how you're donating blood. Blood banks only let you donate every eight weeks, and they take a little less than half a liter. Depending on how much your vampire takes, you may want to consider that extending that timeline. Pay attention to your body and watch out for weakness, fatigue, irregular heartbeat, shortness of breath, dizziness, and chest pain, because those can be signs of anemia. Needless to say, when in doubt, go see a doctor, especially if you plan on making it a regular thing. Since most vampires can't survive on half a liter every eight weeks, and you can't survive more than that, they're going to need at least one other source. No, blood banks are not a solution. For one, those are for people who actually need it in life or death emergencies. They're not juice boxes just because you have insecurities over your blood buddy's dietary requirements. Two, that's like expecting them to live off of the equivalent of diet shakes. Besides, the security on those places is pretty high, so it's not like picking up a carton of milk. Again, this is something that should be discussed as part of the ground rules. If you plan on donating to more than one vampire, take all these potential risks and multiply them, especially if you feed them at the same time. Your consent checklist also grows because some types of vampires can get territorial over their food. While it might sound sexy to be fought over like a piece of meat, 
Two hostile vampires can put the lives of any bystanders, including you, at stake. <laughs> Don't fool yourself into thinking you can get away with feeding multiple vampires without them knowing, because many of them can smell another of their kind. It's a trait that prevents them from poaching on another's territory. In short, imagine every worst case scenario you can think of and prepare for it. It would totally bite to find yourself in a sucky situation and not know what to do when it could have been easily avoided with some communication. Don't be sanguine and oh. trust your partner to know what you want or what to do in case of an emergency. Not everyone is psychic. In the same vein, oh, communication should be ongoing because situations may change. <laughs> and for the record, all puns are always intended here. <laughs> Hazel, that last one was a stink. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you have any advice that we missed here, let us know. And tune in next time for more content you can sink your teeth into. Oh, for Pete's sake, Hazel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already <a> here! <laughs> I hope it's all right for me to write to you. Me and my friend have known each other since uni. My family's a bit complicated. I've got this one cousin. Is an obligate carnival. Situation is being complicated by her thrall. My girlfriend is from a different genus to me. I say no neighbors. There is one. I've got lots of friends who are creatures. Which Muppet is the sexiest? And I wish I could tell you I didn't see the mushrooms until it was too late. But I'm so lonely. Time's a bit weird here. Rubbing themselves clean, their arms, their face, wiping over every part of themselves. My cabbages. I kissed her under oceans, among the stars. Yuck. And before you know it, it stopped drop and roll in the middle of the foyer. Cold, emotionless eyes. There's no sugar coating it. I died. You can imagine that it's a bit of a sore spot for me. Too bloody weird. I don't want to hurt my friend. I don't want to get the council involved. How can I make amends to her? How do I close this distance between us? Is there any salvaging this situation? How do I stop feeling like this? I'm at my wit's end. But isn't there anything I can do? What can I do? What should I do? Please help. Monstrous Agonies, weekly advice for creatures of the night. New episodes every Thursday. Listen online at monstrousagonies.co.uk or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening. Today's episode was written by Brenna Anderson Dowd. Performed by Brenna Anderson Dowd and Frederick Elmore. Sound editing by Frederick Elmore. Music by Kevin Elmore. Find us on Facebook at Care and Feeding of Werewolves. Tweet us at Care Werewolves or email us at feedingwerewolves at gmail.com. Please rate and review. Care and Feeding of Werewolves is a podcast distributed by Kerfuffle and Chaos Productions and licensed under a Creative Commons non commercial attribution share alike 4.0 international. All content on the Care and Feeding of Werewolves podcast is fictional and for entertainment purposes only. Content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your doctor or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of an episode. 
reliance on any information provided by care and feeding of werewolves, kerfuffle and chaos productions, or anyone involved with the production of this podcast is solely at your own risk. If you're looking for advice on placement and treatment of vampire bites, we have questions.